Pastor Dennis coming to you on this Bible study session that we want to do. I um, wanted to bring you some inspirational thoughts this week. Uh, we are planning to open up Sunday for church services, so we're excited about that. We invite you to join us and be a part of that on uh, May 17th. But uh, hopefully you can be here and join us if you're healthy and strong and we feel like getting out. Uh, we look forward to seeing you with that. Uh, but with those ideas in mind, I wanted to bring you a scripture passage. We've been kind of going through Second Kings here on Wednesdays uh, that we've had these different studies. And uh, tonight we're going to be looking at Second Kings chapter 6, moving all the way through chapter 7. Um, we're going to start in the latter part of 6. And so if you have your Bibles and would like to turn there with me, we're going to be looking starting in verse 24 of chapter 6 and then end up pretty much covering all the rest of chapter 7 as they kind of link together. Um, all this passage through here, Second Kings, uh, does focus on the life of Elisha and uh, his uh, ministry and his uh, opportunities to serve the Lord. Um, so it's a really uh, kind of unique time in the time of Israel. There's a lot of uh, battles going on for place and position uh, when it comes to uh, the various kings, various leaders. They're kind of fighting over uh, who has control and power. And so uh, we're uh, coming to a scenario here where we see that um, in verse 24. Uh, we see, begin to see one of the kings uh, attacking uh, Israel uh, and besieging them. So let's pick up in verse 24 um, of the passage here in Second Kings chapter 6. Um, it says, Afterwards, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, mastered his entire army and went up and besieged Syria. And there was a great famine in Syria, as they besieged it, until a donkey's head was sold for eight shekels of silver, and the fourth part of a cob of, of dove's dung for five shekels of silver. Now, as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord will not help you, how shall I help you? From the threshing floor or from the winepress? And the king, uh, excuse me, and the king asked her, What is your trouble? And she answered, This woman said to me, Give your son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him, and on the next day I said to her, Give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. And when the king heard these words of the woman, he tore his clothes. Now he was passing by on the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth underneath his, on his body. And he said, May God do so to me and more also, if the head of Elisha, the son of Sepheth, remains on his shoulders today. Now that's the start of the passage we want to cover today. I wanted you to understand the complexity of the time in which we're dealing with. Uh, Elisha is serving the king and the kingdom. Um, he is not part of the siege. Uh, he's in a little different part of the, of the region. Uh, but the king has come and taken over Syria and has stopped any trade or any uh, things coming into the community. And because of it, the people are in very dire straits. Times were hard. Uh, there wasn't enough food. In fact, when you talk about a, a donkey's head being sold for eight shekels of silver, um, I don't know about you, but I'm not really a fan of eating donkey's head. Um, but I guess if you were hungry and you're in a famine, you would want to eat anything you could get your hands on. In fact, uh, a cob here of dove's, uh, of dove's dung, uh, which was um, something that I personally wouldn't want to eat. I've eaten some weird things with snails and things, but uh, not something I would cherish to go out to a restaurant and get. Um, all of these things are costing exorbitant prices. So you can imagine uh, what flour or barley or wheat are costing. Uh, they're costing more than a day's wage uh, to get these items. And so the famine has gotten great. Challenges are great all around them. Um, and, you know, there for a while during our pandemic, you'd go to the grocery store and uh, there wouldn't be any food. You'd go down the aisles if you went late in the afternoon and you would notice that 
um, all of the shelves were somewhat empty. You couldn't get certain items. In fact, uh, even just last week, if you went to get certain meat items, uh, it seemed like the meat shelves were gone because uh, a lot of the uh, meat packing plants have had to shut down due to the coronavirus. And so uh, there's a sense of that feeling. Now, I have not seen exorbitant prices or anything like that, but there's a feeling of urgency on the behalf of individuals. And so that's what they're feeling. So much so to the point that uh, the people have gone crazy. Uh, they're doing crazy things. Uh, this woman offers up her son to be boiled. Um, she makes a bartering deal with another woman. You, I'll, you boil my son today, we'll boil your son tomorrow. Um, the thought of that is heinous. It's grotesque. Um, the thought of cannibalism um, at a time when you're hungry and you're being uh, under a wartime scenario like this. And this upsets the king greatly. Uh, the king is angry at God. Uh, maybe someone out there who's hearing this Bible study, you're angry at God. You've lost your job. Money's tight. Uh, the, the things of this virus are challenging. Um, you're fed up with it. You want to get back to work. You want to get back to life. Uh, maybe some of you are scared at home and you think, I can't go out and even shop. I can't go in and do the things at, at uh, various stores or I can't even go out and get food for myself at the grocery store. You may be feeling some of these thoughts. Uh, Elisha here is, is going to relieve the trouble um, in doing so, but the king is upset, and he wants Elisha's head on a platter. He's blaming God, and he thinks by killing Elisha that he will somehow release God uh, or release this situation from them uh, and remove it from them because God will then somehow find favor on him for doing this because he blames Elisha for bringing about the famine, even though Elisha had nothing to do with it. So picking up in verse 32, uh, it says, Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. The elders would have been anyone who was uh, uh, maybe another prophet or someone else who was serving Elisha. Um, and it says, Now the king has dispatched a man from his presence, but before the messengers arrived, Elisha said to the elders, Do you see how this murderer has sent to take off my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold the door fast against him. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And while he was still speaking with them, the messenger came down with him or to him and said, This trouble is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer. And so uh, God reveals to Elisha that the messenger's coming. And he says, uh, with the messenger coming, be assured that the king's footsteps are right behind them. And so uh, Elisha knows it's about ready to happen. He's a man of God. Um, he could see the future coming. He could see future events. Um, and so uh, we're looking for someone to tell us what our future is going to look like, are we not? Uh, wouldn't we love to have Elisha here right now to tell us what uh, the future looks like, when this will all be over, uh, when the situations will be restored, uh, when our country will be back to normal? And right now, no one can tell us that. Um, but in Elijah's case, he had insight in that. And so beginning of chapter 7, verse 1, uh, we see Elisha's response. Uh, it says, but Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord, thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a, a sea of flour, a fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. And then the captain on, on whose head the king learned, uh, leaned, said to the man of God, if the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? But he said, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And so Elijah looks at, at the man who's come, the captain of this army that's come to take him down. Um, and he tells him, look, by tomorrow, this is all going to be fine. By tomorrow, everything's going to be freed up. Um, you're going to be able to buy uh, flour and you're going to be able to buy barley at this normal price, uh, the re reasonable price of what it would normally cost. Uh, the captain has his doubts, um, and so he says, you know, surely even if God opened heaven's windows, and so he's mocking uh, God's word, he's mocking God, in that. and there's many in our world that mock um, us as believers and wanting to open up, and uh, us uh, maybe not being uh, tremendously fearful for the protection of the Lord, and um, there are many that mock that endeavor, and so uh, that's where uh, God comes in and steps in a lot of times does a miracle that the world can't even understand. Um, and then in verse 3, 
Uh, we get to the meat of where we're going to look at here for a few moments. It says, now there were four men who were lepers uh, at the entrance of, to the gate. Now remember, a leper is someone that can't really be a part of the community. Uh, they have to yell unclean anytime they come near them. They would have been outcasts. Uh, they're sitting outside the city, um, and so therefore they're outside the gate. And it says, and they said to one another, why are you sitting, why are we sitting here until we die? In other words, they're starving to death. What, why don't we do something? If we say, let us enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. So what good would it do to go into the city? And if we sit here, we die also. So now, come, let us go over to the camp of the Syrians. If they spare our lives, we shall live. And if they let us go, uh, and if they kill us, then we shall but die. So they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. But when they came to the edge of the camp of the Syrians, behold, there was no one there. And then he tells us what happened. For the Lord had made a great army, or made the great army of the Syrians, hear a sound of chariots and horses, and the sound of a great army, so that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come against us. So they fled away in, tw in the twilight and abandoned their tents, their horses, their donkeys, leaving the camp as it was and fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the edge of the camp, they went into the tents and ate and drank and they carried off silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. And they came back and entered another tent and carried off things from it and went and hid them. And so here these lepers, these outcasts, have gone um, to say, let's just go out and see if the Syrians kill us. If they kill us, we're going to die anyway. If they don't kill us, then maybe we can get something to eat from them. we get some of their scraps. Uh, they get there. There's no army there. God has caused a great sound to occur, uh, the sound of an army attacking. Um, they fear that it's the Hittites and Egyptians and that they're going to be destroyed, and so they flee. They run off. And the lepers are there, and they begin to eat and pillage and have a great time. And look at what happens in verse 9. It says, And they said to one another, they grew a conscience. It says, they, We are not doing right. This day is the day of good news. If we, are, if we are silent and wait until the morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now therefore come, let us go and tell the king's household, so they can, they can come and... So they came and called... Uh, to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there, there was no one seen or heard there, nothing but the horses tied and the donkeys tied and the tents as they were. And when the gatekeeper called out, called out, and it was told within the king's household, and the king arose in the night and said to his servants, I will tell you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we are hungry. Therefore, they have gone out of the camp and hid themselves in the open country, thinking they will come out of the city. We shall take them alive and get into the city. And one of his servants said, Let some men take five of the remaining horses, seeing that those who are left here are, will, fare, will fare like the whole multitude of Israel who have already perished. Let us send and see. So they took two horsemen, and the king sent them after the army of the Syrians, saying, Go and see. So they went after them as far as the Jordan, and behold, all of the way was littered with garments and equipment that the Syrians had thrown away in their haste. And the messenger returned and told the king. So it is as these lepers have said. Uh, the king is worried that when they leave the city to go take the pillage and the plunder, um, that uh, they will come and they will come down from the hills and kill them. Um, and so he says, uh, we're not going to do it. We're not going to go out. So there's this fear, a fear of entering out, a fear of exiting the city, uh, even though the Lord has given them this plunder. Um, and so they're fearful. They're, they're sitting uh, waiting for something greater to happen, uh, waiting for the next good thing to occur. Um, you know, I, I want to encourage you in your home that if you're sitting there and, and you're struggling over whether to get out or to, to move on, um, to go back to life as it was, I want to encourage you that the Lord is still in control. I'm not saying go out and be ignorant. I'm not saying that if you have health conditions or major concerns in your life that you shouldn't stay home. Um, you should. 
Uh, but at the same time, there are those of you that are hearing this message that could get out or could come to church on Sunday, but you're fearful. You're fearful of what might occur, what might happen, not what will happen, but what might happen. And I just want to encourage you and say the Lord is still strong. The Lord is with us. And I want to encourage you to not be afraid to come back to church, to come back to fellowship, to engage with one another, to get back to life, to rejoice in the celebration of life. Um, we can't allow a virus, something we can't see, touch, feel, other than until its effect, destroy our lives forever. And so take caution as you wish. But at the same time, we can't be like the king here and just say that uh, we, we have to be separated completely. When they went and investigated, guess what? The armies had fled just as they said. The armies were rushing away. And, and so look at what happens in verse 16. And the people went out and plundered the camp of the Syrians. So a syrah of fine flour was sold for a shekel and the two syrahs of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Now the king had appointed the captain on whose hand, on hand he had leaned to have charge over the gates. And the people trampled him in the gate so that he died. As the man of God had said when the king came down to him, and when the men of God had said to the king, two syrah of barley shall be sold and a, for a shekel, and two syrah of fine flour for a shekel, about that time tomorrow at the gates of, of Samaria, the captain had answered the man of God, if the Lord himself should make windows of heaven, could such a thing be? And he had said, You shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And so it happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gates, and he died. You see, this man, this captain, uh, d denied the joy of what God might do. He didn't believe it. He didn't believe Elisha, even though Elisha knew he was coming, even though Elisha had a reputation, um, even though they were blaming God for it. And Elisha said, God's going to restore you. Um, you know, many may have blamed God for this going around in our world. Many of, of people have said, you know, what, where is God in all of this? Um, and we should not mock God. We should not mock him. For when you mock God, uh, it, tremendous things can happen against you. For God is powerful. And God is watching. He's seeing what's going on. He's seeing your reaction to his blessing. He's seeing our reaction to what's going on around us. And so we have to be cautious with that. Um, and as the people went out, they go out, they plunder this whole encampment, they bring back all the food, and they are restored, they are refreshed. Prices go back to normal, food begins to move around. Um, God's blessing was upon the people. But notice that his blessing didn't come uh, just by happenstance. It came along because the people were in need. Um, you know, really the king, when he, when he tore his clothing and he had sackcloth on and he was, he was presenting himself before God, even though he's angry with God, God had heard his prayer. He had heard his request. And he answered that by sending this noise, this distraction, this fear into the Syrians and caused them to flee. And in doing so, a great blessing came. You know, today you may be hearing this message and you may be thinking, what, what does this have to do with me? How does this apply to me as a person? Well, I just want to encourage you that God is still in control. That God is watching over his people. He has protected us during this time. Uh, we can say that social distancing is working. We can say that um, all the measures we've taken are good. Uh, but at the same time, there comes a point when we have to get back to life. And I believe that time has come. I believe for many of you, you are healthy and strong. Um, you can come and be a part of the fellowship. You can uh, express uh, the glory of God uh, with one another uh, as we gather together on Sunday. And I just want to encourage you to be bold and be strong and stand in the presence of the Lord. But again, if you feel that your health is such that you can't be a part of it, we respect that. We respect it completely. Um, and I would never encourage someone to come that has health conditions or health problems. Uh, but for those of you that are strong and healthy, I implore you to come to, to show the world um, that we're not uh, being uh, pushed aside anymore. And Sunday, we're going to talk about religious freedom. And we're going to celebrate in the Lord with our religious freedom. 
And so I want to encourage you to be a part of that service, a part of that religious freedom on Sunday. Uh, may God bless this time. May he bless our gathering on Sunday. I pray our world be protected and that we can see uh, the end of this very soon and that life can go back to normal as we have events coming up. Uh, if you come Sunday, there'll be a few things that are different. I've spent the day marking off pews where you can't sit. I've marked pews where it's blocked off for, for uh, certain areas. Um, so when you come in, there's going to be some changes. Uh, but when you come, we're going to have your safety in mind. Uh, we are taking measures to fog the church and do a germ kill. Um, that'll be done on Saturday. Um, and we encourage you to come and, and see uh, how worship can affect you. Also, the basement remodel is taking place downstairs. I invite you to come and take a look at that as we have uh, walls up. And by Saturday, we're going to continue working. So by Sunday, uh, we should have a majority, if not all, of the walls up. Anyway, enough of all of that. I just wanted to say uh, welcome back, um, and uh, may God bless our church at Central Baptist Church. May he bless your lives, and may he protect you just as he protected uh, Samaria whenever they were in a time of need. Uh, God bless.